plea of guilty, including drafting a plea, questioning by presiding officer, role of prosecution in terms of section 112, section 113, section 114, and changing the plea during trial. This is the schedule that we will then be dealing with uh, today. Uh, today, now we are going to deal with establishing relations with state officials. As I've indicated to you yesterday, a court can function on its own. A court has to have people who assist it in order to do its job to the best of its ability. Uh, when do we start? We start at when the person is arrested and the more especially the person that we deal with on a daily basis is the investigating officer. He is the main man in this whole thing. He is the one who has to compile all the evidence, who has to go and visit the addresses. And from there, that person gives then the docket to whom? to the prosecutor. We hardly deal with the station commander, but however, as part of the head of the police station, we just mentioned the station commander. But the most person that we deal with, we don't even deal with members of the uniform branch because they just do arrest and hand the suspect to the investigating officer who has the duty to see to it that justice is is being done at the end of the day once the investigating officer has opened charge the suspect open a docket and compile the necessary evidence he then gives the docket to the prosecutor. The prosecutor is the one who has to then decide what to do with this case, either to place it on the roll, not to place it on the roll, or to nolly prosecute the matter, meaning the deciding uh, to decline to, to prosecute. So the prosecutor as well, as soon as the, met, the, the docket gets to court, he plays a very significant role. He is the sole heir of the docket. He has to see to it that nothing happens to the docket. He is in his uh, uh, sole care of the docket up until the docket is being booked back to the police station. They have a register whereby they register all the, uh, uh, all the dockets that were received and those that were handed back to the station. In a day or two, the investigating officer will then be in possession of the docket uh, that was uh, sent to court. And as soon as he receives the docket, he has to comply with instructions that are given to him by the prosecutor. If maybe the prosecutor wants him to obtain uh, more evidence such as video footages or supplementary statements, he will write, he or she will write in the, we call it the IO diary at the back of the, of the docket. Uh, and then he writes his instructions as to what then the I.O. has to do. And once the I.O. complied with the instructions from the prosecutor on the next return date, then the matter will then uh, proceed. However, sometimes the, pros the, the investigating officers, they don't do their work. And then they will then tell you to say, oh yeah, but I have a lot of cases that I deal with, or I was on leave, or the docket was locked in my office and I was not there. And that on its own is a problem because this will defeat the ends of justice because without him, doing his share, the matter won't proceed. Then on the other hand, the prosecutor as well, no, my hands are tight, but I gave the prosecute, the, the investigating officer instructions that he needs to follow, but he did not comply. And if let's say you are faced in such a situation and you are of the view that your client is prejudiced with such non-compliance, you can object to another postponement and you raise the 
the fact that the, pro, the, the investigating officer had ample opportunity to do whatever the instructions would have been given to him by the prosecutor. So as I said, the investigating officer after that, the prosecutor who then decides what to do. And should it then be that the prosecutor decides that, oh, but even after further investigations, other witnesses don't comply or they no longer have interest in the matter or they are untraceable, then the prosecutor is dominus litus, he, meaning that he's the main man, he can decide what to do with the docket. Either he closes it or he decides to withdraw the matter provisionally pending the investigations, whereby after a while the matter will then be brought back and uh, the, the, the case proceeds. And the prosecutor's uh, senior or the account to the directors of public prosecutions. If you are not happy with the service that you get from the prosecutor or the, as the senior uh, public prosecutor, you can then approach the directors of public prosecution with regard to whatever uh, your query will then be. Furthermore, the direct, we engage with the director of public prosecutions. If let's say, for instance, uh, your client has a psych mental problem, your client was referred to the district surgeon, then the district surgeon then said, your client needs some evaluation. Once that is being determined, in order for the state to decide whether to prosecute or not, the director of public prosecutions comes in, whereby they will give a way forward as to what will then happen in the matter. So if you are not satisfied with this, you take it further to the director of public prosecutions, or if there are matters that needs to be decided, by someone senior to the pub, to the uh, public prosecutor you are with, then the matter can then be referred to the directors of public prosecutions for uh, for a decision. As I indicated even yesterday, we work very closely hand in hand with the clerk of the court. The clerk of the court is the one who is the sole custodian of charge sheets. So if you want any charge sheet with regard to your client's matter, you can request a copy thereof from the clerk of the court. Furthermore, they are custodians of court books. Any court book, as I indicated, we have a first appearance court book, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday court books, each day on its own. All the first appearances go in one book then they are as well custodians of uh, child justice matters where a minor is involved. They have to keep record of same of which they have their own book, which is not party to the one that uh, is being used by others. Again, when you need to pay bail for your client whilst at court, they clerk of the court is the one who handles finances, is the one who will then, uh, after the court granted your claim bail, the court orderly will take the charge sheet to, with your family member or with you, the attorney, to the clerk of the court so that you can then pay. So they are the ones that handles finances as well, either by receiving bail money or when people pay a fine and as well giving payouts as with regard to uh, uh, bail money that of, of which the matter has then been finalized. As well, the clerk of the court, they play a very, very, very uh, significant role. Furthermore, if let's say your client wants to pay a deferred fine, a deferred fine is that fine whereby your client is given the opportunity to pay a fine in installments. It's the duty of the clerk of the court to complete the necessary paperwork, whereby he will call the employer, verify 
if whether you, the, your client is employed there, verify banking details, because sometimes people might give wrong information or they might give a uh, wrong, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, phone numbers and only to find that they are not working there or it's just a friend's number. So if they don't do their job well in terms of that, that is a problem. As I say, they, uh, they play a very, very, very huge uh, role in terms of running of, uh, of being the custodians of court books, uh, fines and all that. And don't forget, once you, you, you give them the money, they must give you the receipt, the proof of payment to then show that you indeed paid whatever, either it's a bail money or it's, uh, it's, it's the receipt for a fine. Then we have correctional services. Correctional services, uh, each court has a correctional officer which de who deals rather with uh, correctional supervision and as well our uh, suspects or our accused persons when detained without bail they are kept at a correctional facility so correctional uh, uh, services as well plays a very significant role whereby they are the ones that are the custodians of seeing to it that everybody who is in their care is well taken care of. However, we do receive um, complaints from our clients to then say that uh, they are not treated well, but it's not because it's not because of the correctional services, it's because of the fellow uh, inmates that they are with. So it's just the survival of the fetus, it's just unfortunate of the stories that we, we normally hear, of which is very sad, but however, there's nothing we can do. As I said the, yesterday, the correctional services won't accept the person without a warrant of detention. The, after the matter is being postponed in custody where your client doesn't have bail or where your client bail was fixed but has not then been paid, then the clerk of the court has to write a warrant of detention, which we call it a J7, which is signed by the presiding officer, the magistrate, who orders that the person be kept at the correctional facility up until his next court date. If the person is, they cannot accept without that. And as I said, the date is very important. If your client has another matter or was arrested whilst uh, out on bail for another matter, they won't listen to him. They only rely on the J7. But should it then be that maybe you want your client to appear, you can uh, make arrangements with the investigating officer for your client to be requisitioned and then so that he can come to court for any other matter because the requisition will only be the one that will warrant his liberty. Other than that, there's no way your client will then be released. Furthermore, we have interpreters. As you can see, South Africa now is diverse. We have uh, different languages. We try to cater almost everyone in respect of the language they talk. However, at some point we are battling. Some people are remanded in, in custody for some time while still awaiting <clears throat> for, the, for the interpreter of the language the accused speaks. Like for instance, here in Pretoria, <clears throat> we have a problem with the Chichewa interpreter, the language spoken in Malawi. We battle a lot because she travels most of Houteng a, a province. And as a result, as at the time when we need her here, we are battling. But however, I've learned to then say that they are trying to get someone who will then try to assist 
in terms of the Chichewa language. But not only Chichewa, uh, all any other language, the person has to be tried in his or her language that he understands. So uh, interpreters as well plays a very, 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 very important role in terms of uh, running court. Then we have the court orderly. The court orderly are police officers of the police station within which the jurisdiction of the court is, and their duty is to see to it that they go to prison to transport the inmates. If let's say we have uh, suspects that were rem suspects that were remanded in custody without bail or could not have uh, been able to afford bail, is the duty of the court orderlies to go and fetch them from prison so that they can come and have their day in court. And while others are going to fetch them from prison, there are those that keep records of those that are being brought for first appearances from the police station. So once they come, they come with the body receipts, they come with the dockets, and they have to see to it that this is the same person and this is the same number of people the police allege they have brought. So they record them in the court books as well, they have their registers where they put everyone's name in there of the person they have in their care. And from there, whenever the matter is remanded, then they then go there to and write it down to say, this matter is remanded to this date and so forth and so forth. So without the, uh, we normally call a strokey whereby uh, just a slip whereby they order that the person be released either when the charges were withdrawn against the person or when maybe the person was released on warning. So they enter that into their court books to then say that the court ordered this person has to be released or the person has paid bail or the person has paid a fine. So if you don't have any of these documents, and your client is in custody, there's no way your client can then be released. So they do help as well in terms of that. Furthermore, when the court is in session, court orderlies are the ones that maintain the order to see to it that no one makes noise in court, no phone rings or call even uh, witnesses outside, or should the, the court on the bench want something, they normally uh, send them to help out. Because members of the public are not allowed to approach the bench directly. As you know, it's not safe anymore. People can do whatever they want. And as a result, uh, what would then the orderly have done to secure the safety of everyone Sorry, who is in court or, uh, or in that on that day? So as well, they play a very important role, and all these people that I'm, I've mentioned, the court orderlies, the interpreters, the clerk of the court, some of the investigating officer, they might not be uh, where we are in terms of qualifications. But however, they've been in court for years and years. They have experience. They know the court procedure in and out. If you are still new in the field and there's something that you don't know or you want to ask, you can approach the court orderly. You can approach the interpreter or even the clerk of the court and ask whatever that you would want to ask and they will gladly assist. Like for instance, where I am, we are a very small community. They help one another. You don't have to be scared to then say that, oh, I'm not going to appear because I don't know what will I then have to do or what will I say? So these are the role players that uh, see to it that the court runs if the court runs efficiently on a daily basis. Then investigations. 
in terms of investigations, uh, the power, the police have all the rights, have all the powers to can arrest, to can seize, to can search or obtain evidence and even further to interrogate someone. However, even though they have the right to do that, they, their rights are limited. They can't just go overboard and just beat people just to uh, get information that they want. There should be reasons as to why would they do that? Why would they use a force in order for them to, to can, um, to, how can I say, to, to either search the property or seize whatever they they are. So if you can then read your sections, section 19 to 36, as well as section 49 of the criminal, 48 rather, of the Criminal Procedure Act, they deal with all these uh, topics that I've mentioned here in terms of search, seizure, arrest, and obtaining evidence, as well as interrogation. So guard against that, that even if they have the right to do so, but they can't just over, go overboard and overstep their boundaries in terms of doing that. So if there's a case law of NDPP and others versus Zuma and another, which is a 2008 volume one SACR 258, it's a Supreme Court of Appeal decision, that paragraph eight, then the court there explained the need for the extensive power of search and seizure provided uh, to the investigators in, uh, in terms of the Directorate of Special Operations. So if you can just check on that, it's in your study guides as well, and then just read it so that you can familiarize yourself as to what powers do they have. Then objects which are susceptible to seizure. Uh, seizure meaning to be seized. There are three classes of objects which are which can be seized, which are objects which are reasonably or are suspected to be involved in the commission of the offense. If the police officer is of the view that this might be used or he thinks that this has been used in the commission of an offense, the police officer has the right to see such object. Or if the police officer can provide evidence that this object was used in the commission of the offense or allegedly in the commission of the offense, even such evidence can then be seized. Or that they are to be used at a later stage or reasonably he believes that they are intended to be used in the commission of the offense. Such can then be seized. Normally this third one, we see it when your client is being arrested for possession of car or house breaking implements. So your client would have then been uh, found in possession of either a side cutter or, uh, or they 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 know they normally make their own uh, like a uh, what do they, they a t, like a T square so but there are objects that are self made then should it then be that the officer suspects that oh but this time of the night uh, this person is having such uh, uh, implements. Why? And should your client as well fail to give a reasonable account as to why is he in possession of such implements? Then the police officer can seize them and then uh, uh, and just take them away from, from your client. As well, this is very important as you should know what to uh, what to expect should then you come across uh, matters whereby they involve seizure. This is very, very, very important. So furthermore, let's continue with the searching of a person who is arrested. 
Then this is governed by Section 23 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Only a peace officer may search and seize uh, a person who is arrested. No any other person, no members of the public, no any other person uh, is allowed or can be or allowed to search an arrested person. Only peace officers can search. And the objects that the person uh, will be searched of will normally be those that are mentioned in terms of Section 20 of your Criminal Procedure Act. That's why I say please take note of Section 19 to 36 as well as 48. That is very important in terms of searches and seizures, arrests and so forth. Then we proceed whereby searching in terms of a search warrant. This is when the police have managed to be in position of a warrant. They've managed to apply to court to, and to a, to a magistrate who then issued then with their police officers with a warrant and then they can then only be able to go and search the premise or the property that was uh, identified in the application. So not everyone is given a warrant is being uh, the the magistrate or the justice of the peace is the one who issues that even judges and judicial officers have the capacity as well to uh, to issue warrants in criminal matters so if there is a need that uh, they the police officer wants to go and search a property or they want to go and visit someone or enter someone's premises they have to then get first the application but there are in exceptional cases whereby they can still do that without a warrant so the warrant must be clear as to what is it that they are going to look out for what is the object that they are going to search for or the premises that they are going to search? It must be clearly stated. They can't just say a house. By house, what do you mean? Because there are many houses. So it must explicitly uh, distinguish the, pro the property that they will then be uh, visiting, that they will then be searching. And with that as well, it must be clearly stated to say that we are going to look for a specific thing. So that is very, very, very important. Guard against why did they go there and was this uh, uh, a search lawful? If yes, did it comply? With the, with the requirements thereof. And as well, it must state the offense. Why are they going there? Because they suspect that such an offense has been committed or such an offense is allegedly to be committed. So then we proceed with uh, specific powers of police in terms of Section 25. The police, or, or let me re rather rephrase, peace officers are lawfully authorized to take someone into custody. So if they are of the view that this person is committing an offense or has committed an offense, the police have the right to take that person and put him in custody. And the police as well, have the right to use force, and that is regulated by Section 27. And this is normally when the police just budge into at your place without a, a warrant, then we normally call it a no-knock clause, whereby they just come in and push. Then they say, police, police, uh, like everybody has to lie down and all that and that is uh, as well uh, uh, regulated by the by section 27 of the 
of the Criminal Procedure Act. That is very important as well, because if not, they might be of the view that whatever that they want to obtain might then be uh, disposed of. So to guard against things like that, they will then have to then uh, just go in and should it be that the people are not cooperating, they are then uh, allowed to use law uh, a, a minimum force. But should it be that the police, they take advantage of the fact that people are scared of the police, people don't know of their rights, they can proceed with an unlawful search. And should it then be then that it comes out at a later stage that that police officer was not authorized to do such, then you can then take it up and lay a charge against the said officer, and then he, your, you can then be uh, compensated. So as a result, the, the search is very important. Know your rights, know your client's rights, as to what is it that needs to follow in terms of that. All this is when the police are trying to investigate a matter, trying to accumulate evidence, but however, the evidence must be obtained lawfully so. Then we are proceeding with methods of securing attendance of the accused in court. So how is that possible? Your client is being arrested once uh, uh, your, or an offense rather has been committed. And once an <coughs> offense has then been committed, your client is then being arrested. So the arrest may take place with or without a warrant. So that please take note that you don't have to question that the police can arrest someone even if they don't have a, war a, 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 a warrant. Also, the police as well can, uh, or even if the, the police can arrest in terms of the Immigration Act, even though they are not immigration officers. But however, if they see someone, they can then request papers from that person. And should it then be then that uh, that person cannot, doesn't comply or doesn't have papers, the police also have authority to can arrest such person in terms of the Immigration Act. So arrest with or without a warrant, there are certain requirements. They can't just arrest for the fact of arresting someone and the police have to inform the suspect as to why are they arresting him or her. This is very important. The police have to, arrest, have to inform the suspect as to why they are arresting him or her. And they must give the reasons thereof. After giving the reasons, there must not be a language barrier. They, it must be ascertained to then say that they are talking in the language each the both parties understand. Because if not, then the, 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 the suspect tomorrow might say, no, no, I did not understand what the police officer was saying, or the police officer, I did not get it clear because he was speaking in a language that I did not understand. So be very wary of that and be careful as to your client should know exactly the reasons of his arrest and then of which they must then be provided to him, must speak to him in the language he understands. And from there, after being arrested, he or she must be taken to the uh, um, 
to the prescribed authorities, meaning to the police station. They can't just take him anywhere and interrogate him for no reason. No, no, no. Once that happens, he must then be taken to a police station where he will then be formally shot. And then sometimes during that process, the situation turns out uh, different whereby there will be manhandling of one another there. However, as I've explained earlier, the police have the right to use minimum force. So this is all what happens in terms of the person being arrested. Then we go to the second one, whereby the person will then be issued with summonses. Summons is governed by Section 54 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Basically, a summons means a summary trial. They will summarize the annexure and the charge sheet as to what is it that your client will then be facing or what are the allegations that your client is facing. What normally happens, how do we get to the point of summonses? Summons, the, the prosecutors would have not placed the matter on the roll. Let's say, for instance, the, uh, your client was arrested uh, at a certain point. Let's say, for, in, for instance, dr uh, drunken driving or possession of drugs. Such matters takes a while to be finalized. So for your client to be kept in custody or the matter being hanging uh, over his head, then the prosecutor will then not place the matter on the roll. Then from there, once their investigations are finalized, after they have received all the lab reports and all the necessary information, they will issue out summonses to your client. So this is very, very important, people, because your client has to inform the investigating officer should he change his address. If, let's say, for instance, your client is arrested, he comes to court, the prosecutor decides not to, uh, to, to continue with the matter or not place it on the roll, then from there, they would sign the bail receipt at the back. Then you can catch your bail money, then they, they will tell you, you are free, you can go. Please take note that should your client change his address, please notify the investigating officer. Cause should it then be that they want to issue these summonses and your client cannot be found at the address that he provided, then they will then issue a warrant of his arrest. So this is very, very, very important. Then you will then be surprised one day going to OR, not knowing that you have a warrant of your arrest, then only to find that, oh, oh, please move to the side. Then what's wrong? Apparently you have a warrant of your arrest. No, but I don't know anything about it and whatever. Then only to find out, is that case that happened two years ago? or three years ago that you uh, you even forgot about. However, the issue is that you relocated or changed your address and did not notify the investigators of your new address. So this is very, very important. We see it happening a lot. People coming back from the border or wherever, having to attend for something of which they did not know of. And even some of the uh, presiding officers, they presume that you as the legal representative, you are aware of such information. And as a result, you have to inform your client. So because your client is legally represented, they don't extend that information to your client. And only to find that you as well as the legal representative, you don't know. And unfortunate for your client, will be faced in a, in a situation as at the time, and that won't be nice. So please 
guard against that and notify your client as soon as they change their address to then say that should you then please notify the the IO. This happens same as well with when your client's charges are provisionally withdrawn. Still, people are just happy to say, hey, I'm off the hook because I'm going to get my bail money, this, 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 not knowing that there are prospects of the docket being traced or the complainant say, mm -mm, now I still want to proceed with the matter. And then if you change your address, then you are going to incur problems of not being uh, found when you are needed. Then the third way of securing your attendance is by written of notice. Written of notice in terms, is in terms of section 56 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Who issues this written notice? Is the peace officer uh, at the police station and what 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 grounds what is he looking for here is a suspect he's been arrested why would the peace officer give this person a written notice and not uh, give this person or, or or the prosecutor give this person bail or this person awaits his day in court the most reason is because if the peace officer is of the view that the magistrate court will give a con or upon conviction will impose a fine not exceeding 5,000 rands. He may then give your client a written notice. Then if he is of the view that upon conviction the court fine won't exceed an amount of 5,000, then the police, uh, the peace officer rather, can give your client a written of notice, meaning that, that your client will then be released, then from there and be told to then say that you then go, then go to court on a specific day. Then on a specific day when the client goes to court, he or she will then find uh, his docket there and then the, the matter will then proceed. So it's another form of uh, not keeping people in custody unnecessarily so. So this is very important. If the peace officer is of the view, that uh, the con upon conviction, a fine won't exceed 5,000, then your client might be re uh, given a written of notice and be warned to come to court on a specific day. Then the other way, one is warning. When your client is released on warning, uh, this is in terms of Section 72 of the Criminal Procedure Act. And when does this happen? happen. Either this happened at the police station or this happens at court. So this one as well, it depends. Normally this happens uh, on petty offenses. If the police, they are of the view, ah, oh, but this person has a fixed address, he can be traced, and the offense that he's been uh, charged with is not of a serious nature. Let's just warn him, let him go to court on a specific day. Or the client comes to court and upon your uh, application, then you request that your client be released on warning. This is what we normally call free bail. So in the language out in the streets, we say it's free bail, but in terms of court proceedings, we say warning. Your client is released on warning. So as I said, if your client has a fixed employment, when in custody might lose his employment, or he might miss his studies, or just can't afford bail, then the court will just look and see that uh, what is it that is, is it in the best interest of justice to keep him in custody 
or not. If it's in their best interest to keep him in custody, the court will then keep him in custody. Or if the court is of the view that the interest of justice does not necessitate him to be incarcerated, he might then be released on warning. But the warning guards against it as well. Should your client miss to come to court, the state uh, will request the court to issue a warrant of his arrest with immediate effect. Very important. If your client is released on warning and fail want to come to court, then the court will issue a warrant of his arrest. This is very, very important. People will then think that, oh, yeah, no, but I managed to get off the hook and ah, I'm not going to court. But however, if he misses his court appearance and then you as the legal representative as well, you don't even have his reasons as to why is this person not here, then just know that your client will be arrested with immediate effect. Then we are then proceeding, securing the release of the accused and the necessary instructions required. So once you get your instructions, once your client is being arrested, you will then be given instructions to then say, will you please uh, help me with a bail application? So at what stage do we do a bail application? A bail application either is done at the police station by a peace officer or by the prosecutor or a formal bail application that needs to be done in court. So at the police station, it's either done by the police or by the prosecutor. If yesterday you can recall, I said, I mentioned a bit about uh, the prosecutors as well, uh, saying, uh, I see someone, viewer, wants to ask a question. Viewer? Um, yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to ask on the previous slide, um, fines, where, where do they fall into those four um, <clears throat> methods of security? attendance like um j534s a fine is is when the matter is being finalized upon conviction so on this four is when we were trying to get your client to come to court we will still get to that where your client will pay a fine either where the court convicts him and gives an option of a fine or where your client uh, pays an admission of guilt fine. We are still going to get to that. It's okay, when we are you. disposing of a matter. All right. Thanks. So here we are securing attendance for your matter to come to uh, to come to court. Are we clear? Noted. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, let's proceed. Uh, so, as sorry, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, my apology. I was trying to raise a hand, but okay. the function could not uh, let me do so. <clears throat> I wanted to check. Uh, when are we going to receive the slides? Because we checked today on the e-leader. I, I could not find anything. Yeah, that will be sorted with uh, Ms. Zuki Swakala. But however, earlier when I spoke to her, she said they were on chat. I don't know, but we will try to sort that out with her. She, yeah, she did promise to have them on e-leader because not everyone has got the e-chat function, like, okay. uh, like in my case. So usually they are posted on e-leader. Thank okay. you. Yeah, but then uh, I will take it up with her and then she will see to it that you guys then get them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. OK, then. Can we proceed? Um, or any questions up to so far? No, it's just a, a request. Is it possible to cross-reference the slides with the notes? Because like one thing is on page 47, now we're jumping to page 71. We're trying to catch up with you, and we're not. But then if you can follow the CCP program, 
I'm this following one I got in front the of program me. that I, I got. I'm, I'm, I'm going through as per, per program. Because like the search and seizure is on page 47. Now we've jumped to 71 for securing the release of the accused. So we, we like, I don't know, maybe I'm the one that's confused. I don't know. Yeah, it's fine, ma'am, continue. Okay. Yeah, as I say, I'm sorry about that. I'm governed by the by the program that was provided to me. Any questions? No questions. Then let's then proceed. Now we are going to, uh, as I said, we are at securing the release of the accused and the necessary instructions required. And the police will fix bail and normally is between 500 to 1,000 rands. Then your client will then be released and be informed of the date to appear in court. Same applies to the prosecutor who will fix bail. We normally call it after hours bail. So as I said yesterday, there are designated uh, prosecutors who has to then be uh, on standby. Then at every police station, they have the name of the prosecutor who is on standby for a month with his contact number. And then should you feel that your client can't sleep overnight and it's in the interest of justice that your client be released, and then you call that person who will come and complete the necessary paperwork and uh, fix bail for your client. But don't forget, as I said, the address must be verified. Your client's profile as well must be clean, meaning that in terms of Section 611B, your client should not have any previous convictions or pending cases. So are we fine with that? Bail will then be fixed. And procedure at bail applications. This is very, very, very important. Here we have, a, we normally call it a bail court. And what happens is this court only deals with bail applications. They can hear the merits of the case because the presiding officer won't be the one, would not be the one who will be attending to the, to the trial at a later stage. If you are familiar with Pretoria, this is court 16, we call it the bail court. And like, for instance, as I said, I'm based here in Hatfield, of which is one of the, um, the, the, the branch courts we deal with bail applications here by ourselves. And what happens is you will then approach the prosecutor. First thing, is my client's address verified? If yes, then step two, does my client have, does your profile show anything about my client? Don't forget you would have know you would have known this information from your client. So sometimes clients mislead you to then say, no, I'm a first time offender. I don't have any previous convictions or pending cases, but don't be shocked and be surprised. As at the time when the prosecutor reads out the formal, uh, the bail affidavit that would have then been disposed of by the investigating officer, then they mention things that you don't know of. So verify as well with the prosecutor to say that does the profile uh, say exactly what your client's instructions are. So what happens is it will determine if your client has previous convictions or pending cases where he is released on bail, then you bring a formal bail application. We call it a Schedule 5 bail application. So the onus is on him to show to the court to then say that the interest of justice permits your release, his release on bail. What will happen is you will prepare an affidavit whereby you will say all his personal circumstances, what work does he do, how much does he earn, any children, does he have a passport, 
What work does he do? All the personal circumstances. What assets does he have? What, are, what, are, what is the state's case? Or how strong is the state's case against your client? So it's the form of an affidavit. It will depend with your, your, your circumstance, your client's circumstances. Then you prepare that so that your client doesn't have to testify. If you want your client to testify, your client can be called out to the box and testify. But that we got against that because you are opening your client to cross-examination by the state. So whilst it's an affidavit, everybody accepts it as the evidence because this would have then been commissioned by the commissioner of oath. So what will happen is then the prosecutor will inform the court to then say that this matter is on the roll for a formal bail application. Then from there, she keeps quiet. Then you then stand up to then say, you confirm your appearance on behalf of the accused person. You do confirm that this is a Schedule 5 bail application. And why? Because your client either has previous convictions or pending cases. Then from there, you beg leave to the court to read out the affidavit into the record. So once you you read that out, once you read that out to the court, you request the affidavit to be accepted as evidence. Then from, from there, can I continue? Excuse someone is busy talking at the background. Can they mute their their phone? So uh, they are they are left off when they are talking. Because it's uh, it's disturbing on my side. Can I continue? Okay. So once you handed in the affidavit as an exhibit, as an exhibit, the court will then ask you is this your case then from there you will then say yes that's my case then the prosecutor will then stand up as well read out the affidavit that would be disposed by the io to then give reasons as why they are opposing your client's release on bail so normally is because your client has propensity to commit offenses or your client has a warrant of arrest from somewhere, or your client uh, um, doesn't uh, uh, adhere to the bail conditions. All that information will then be included in his affidavit, or your client doesn't have even a fixed address. So now the state's contention will then be where will we get this person? Should he then be released? So then the court will make a decision as to is whether in the interest of justice to release such a person out on bail or not. Then once then the court views that it's in the interest of justice, then an amount of bail will then be fixed. So normally the court will try to balance between whatever the state would have suggested, as well as whatever you would then say uh, you can afford. But sometimes you might find that the court, because of the risk involved, they will then uh, put an exorbitant amount. But that is not justifiable because putting a lot of uh, uh, money sometimes is being regarded as like denying the accused person's uh, uh, right to bail. So should it then be that uh, your client bail is fixed, they will pay, he will then be released. If they can't pay, then he will then be in custody. And should it then be that he's in custody and the matter proceeds, but bail was fixed, on the next occasion, you can still even request to the Honorable Court to say that we would like to bring an application for the reduction of bail money because the court previously fixed such an amount and my client now can afford it, then we request a bail to be reduced to this specific amount. Then the court will decide whether it's in the interest of justice to do same or not. And if 
the client's bail is being rejected the, or dismissed, then you have the right to approach the high court where you will then have to then appeal that bail denier. So that process will be on its own at the, at the high court. And should it be then, or, or let before it be like should it be, uh, once the court um, fixed bail, your client will be ordered to come to court on the next day. That date will then be given out. It would have then been arranged between you and the prosecutor, sometimes as well as the interpreter of the language the client uh, will then be speaking. So if your client fails to comply, cause the bail is extended on each next court date. Should it be then that bail was fixed today, then the court orders that uh, he comes to court next week, let's say next week Friday, then your client fails to comply. It's one of the bail conditions that he was ordered to come to court. Should he fail to comply, a warrant of his arrest will then be issued. So once a warrant of his arrest is issued the, with immediate effect, but you as the defense, will, you'll have to address the court and give the court reasons as to why is your client not there. Should it be then that your client is off sick or your client is, I see Gideon wants to say something. Gideon? Hello? Yes, Gideon? I yes. Just want, yes. I wanted to ask uh, the information provided in the affidavit dur during bail application. Can the state use that against the accused during uh, the trial process? Definitely, definitely. That is why, if you remember earlier, I said the court that uh, listens to bail won't be the court that uh, deals with the merits of the case. So you you give out the best information you can get then out of your client to support his release. But that, God against it, that should it be then the state is of the view that's incriminating evidence, they can use that against your client during trial. So when you prepare your bail affidavit with your client, warn the client to then say that the, whatever the information regarding the merits of the case can be used against him during the subsequent trial. A, a follow-up question, ma'am. The, yes. the reason that the court that hears bail is different from the trial court, is, is it not for the protection of the, of the accused? Not necessarily the, the information, the evidence that was led. Because there might be some evidence that the trial court must not hear. That would have then been heard by the by the bail court. And normally, when the you you would have disclosed all your previous convictions to the court, to the bail court. So when the trial court views your client, they already have this thing in mind that this is a criminal. He's a habitual criminal. He has 10 previous convictions or something like that. You understand? So that might be prejudicial to your client. And let's say, for instance, during the sentencing stage and at some point, then the prosecution is not in possession of the SAP 69s. They might want to finalize the, the matter and the court might say, no, 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 no. But I know this person has previous convictions. Why is the SAP 69s not here? You understand? So it might be prejudicial to your client. That is why the bail court has to differ with the trial court. Last question, ma'am. If the court differs, does, does that also include the, the prosecutor or is the prosecutor at the bail court, can it be the same prosecutor at the trial court? No, no. Oh, thank you, the, no. thank you. Yes, thank you. yes. I see there's another hand by Matabata. Matabata? Yes, thanks ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm not sure if I missed 
uh, the difference between the uh, bail application, the police and the prosecutor. Yes. At the moment, I can follow the prosecutor bail, but I don't think I've heard you talking about the police bail. Okay, and I did say the police, the peace officer, any other person from the rank of a warrant office, I think it's sergeant, warrant officer, captain. They have the authority to fix bail at the police station. And that is determined as to the type of offense that your client is facing. You must uh, look at part two and part three of schedule um, of schedule two of 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 the of your criminal procedure act at the back. Then that uh, explains that what type of offenses as well that the police can give bail, and as well this is determined by section fifty nine in the criminal procedure act. Whereas the prosecutors is determined by section 59, capital A. And that one, the offenses thereof are listed in schedule seven. Okay, so the follow up question on that is that uh, the uh, bail uh, by prosecutor will be within that 48 hours? Yes, as soon as your client is being arrested, you would have received instructions to say, my client is arrested. Then where you quickly rush, let's say in this instance, the nearest police station here is Brooklyn Police Station. You rush to Brooklyn Police Station, you find out what the charges are against your client. And then you check if whether it's within those two sections, the schedules that I've uh, uh, mentioned to you, then from there, you then either request the police to fix bail for him or call the prosecutor who is on standby to fix bail for your client. Okay, so so there will be three now. So there will be bail at the police, bail by the prosecutor, and then bail at the uh, uh, at the court. In court. And bail in court is for those that could not be released then, and why would they not have then be released? Either their addresses are not verified, they uh, they have previous convictions and no pending cases and or warrants. Their profile doesn't look good. So as a result, they can't just be released because should they be released, they can disappear. So they will then have to convince someone that it's in the best interest that they be released. Thank you. Can we proceed? Yes, so as I was saying, if your client fails to comply with bail, then you will then have to address the court to say that I don't have instructions to the whereabouts of my client or my client is uh, not well, I received information from family members, then from there, we either you provide a sick note or you provide any proof that will show why is your client not in court. Matabata? Matabata, I see your hand is up. No, thanks, uh, I was disconnected. I will, uh, I will, I will uh, okay. lower my hand. No problem, thank you. So. If you have a reason, you request the court to have to hold over the warrant and be stayed up until the next court appearance. So you don't want the court to issue it out and be uh, out with immediate effect. You then request that we request seeing that uh, if my client is not well, I was informed to say he can only avail himself after three days or four days. We request that my client's uh, warrant be uh, held over up until the next court date. So what normally the court does in this instance to avoid the three days and not still coming, the court has 14 days. So your matter will then be postponed for 14 days, whereby your client has to come up to have the warrant be cancelled. Even if your client didn't give you instructions 
as to where he was on the day in question, but at a later stage, he comes to you to then say, hey, I've learned that I have a warrant of my arrest. Can we go to court to have the warrant cancelled? The court will hold an inquiry as to why your client failed to appear. But what normally happens, they dispose of if it's within the 14 days. They will just ignore it because he's still within the, the, the break period that uh, he was given to for him to appear. But should the 14 days expire, nobody knows when he comes. He has to give, uh, the court will hold an inquiry as to why he didn't come. And if the court doesn't accept his reasons as valid, then the court will then hold him in contempt of court. So from there, he gets a fine, then or he's just a caution and discharged, and the main matter will then proceed at a later stage. Then cancellation of bail. If it appears to the state's attention to then say that your client is problematic, he's interfering with witnesses or bothering witnesses, the, 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 the state, the prosecution can apply for his bail to be cancelled. Or if maybe family members approach you to then say that we've paid bail and this person has been incarcerated for another matter somewhere. We just want our money back because in any way he's in custody for that other matter. Then that can as well be brought then so that who the depositor can then be given his money back. Then the release on warning. The release on warning, as I indicated, is that section 72. Here's your client. Uh, he appeared. He's a suitable candidate to be admitted to bail, but he doesn't have the means. Then you can uh, talk on his behalf and request your client to be released on free bail. Then we have the release of juveniles. Uh, if a minor is being arrested. The first point of departure, there is there are numbers of uh, social workers. We call them probation officers. They are social workers that specializes in criminal matters of which the investigating officer will call the, so the probation officer of the designated area to come and say that, yes, we have a, a minor. Then the a probation officer will rush to the police station, will establish who the parents are, call the parents, and the child has to then be released in the care of the parents as well as of the of the guardian. So key, the minors are not supposed to be locked up unless the offense, the minor is being uh, arrested of is of a serious nature of which then the, the, the child has to then be kept in uh, custody. However, he doesn't have to be mixed up with adults. He's kept in a separate place or he is being sent to Soshanguve Youth Care Center, what we used to call it Stout School back then. So the child will be kept there and then he will then be brought back to court. And if he admits responsibility, the child can then be given a, a, a diversion program, or if not, he can then be, a, 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 the matter be referred to the judge, child justice court. Gideon, I see there's a hand. Yes, ma'am. Releasing the, par the child to the custody of the parent, does that mean uh, the parent is guaranteeing the attendance of the child in court? Yes, there is the duty of the parents to see to it that the child has to be brought back. Because if not, you have to bring it to the attention of the probation officer to then say that you can control the child and you won't be able to monitor his whereabouts and that will then be brought to the attention of the defense. 
Uh, and don't forget, if they can't afford a lawyer, children have, have to be represented by legal aid attorneys. So a legal aid attorney has to be there to see to it that the interests of the minor child are taken care of. So if you, you can't control the child, bring it to the attention of the court, and then the child will be kept in the place of safety. Thank you. Yes. So once then the child uh, 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 admits responsibility, then the child will be given a diversion program whereby he has to comply. And this is very important. Should it be that the parent as well or the guardian is want to come to court and does not come, that's contempt of court. So see to it that the parent or, or as well then comes to court. So the release of uh, or amendment of bail conditions of the accused uh, on account of prison <coughs> conditions. What normally happens is sometimes uh, the conditions in, pre in prison are so bad that there's overcrowding or your client is not well and the family would complain to the senior authorities of the correctional services to say but our 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 family member was more or is molested or is being abused or all these sorts of stories that we hear of what will then happen such a person can then be released in uh, the in out of custody and then from there will be ordered to come to court and uh, appearing as someone who is out on warning. But this hardly happens, but the, I've once seen one whereby it once happened and the family saw to it that the client came to court. Is there any questions here? Okay, and then let's proceed. I see Jacob has raised his hand. Jacob? Jacob? Let's proceed. Jacob will get us. Uh, methods of disposing of a case. Uh, even yesterday, someone asked about representations to the senior public prosecutor and to the director of public prosecutions. So if you are of the view that the state's case is very weak against your client, or they would not then be able to get conviction out of your client. You can have uh, formal representations that are written forward, handed in to the senior public prosecutor, then where you allude as to why you want charges against your client be withdrawn or why you want your client to be given a, a diversion program. So like in this instance, please make sure that you are make copies, you present them in duplicate, they have them stem, the prosecutor who, re who receives them must sign as well to have proof, so that you have proof that the copy was handed over to them. Because if you don't do that, they might at a later stage then be then that uh, no, we didn't receive them or stories. As you know, people might uh, lose documents and say and at the end of the day deny to have received same. So outline your reasons as to why you want your client's uh, matter to be withdrawn or you want your client to be given a diversion program. This is very important for people who are first time offenders of which prospects of them getting a criminal record might jeopardize their future in the, uh, their prospects in the future. So indemnities, this is whereby the person normally is turned out to be a state witness, then whereby the person informs the state to then say, I'm willing to give out information. I'm willing to help out to prove your case on condition that you let me free. And as a result of that, that 
the, the state will rely on Section 205, and this is normally done by the DPP, where they will then use that person. And that can be done as well informally, then to then say that I'm willing to be your informer and give out information only on condition you don't arrest me. Then we have an admission of guilt file. This is very, very, very important because people. Uh, I, think I missed the part on the indemnities. Can you just um, um, repeat that? In terms of indemnities, it's what we used to call Section 204 witnesses. Uh, we call them state. Are you with me? Yes, we are. Yes. If, let's say, there are several accused persons. Then out of the several accused persons, one of them confesses to the police to say that, you know what, I've had enough, I can't deal with this anymore. Can I turn out to be a Section 204 witness? And if the information that they would get from this person will be crucial and incriminate the others, or give the state uh, ammunition to can then be able to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt, such a person can then be indemnified. Or if this, this can as well, this is a formal one whereby uh, the DPP gets involved as well as or paperwork because it has to then be written down so that the person doesn't have to change tomorrow. So this can be done in a formal way and this can as well be done in an informal way, whereby the person just gives out information, they follow it up, nap whoever, then they just release that person. So those are the two types of indemnities, there's formal and there's informal. Then we have an admission of guilt fine. This is governed by section 57 and section 57 capital letter A, and then you have to then compare it with section 342. This is very important. Today we came across uh, one of same, whereby uh, one of our colleagues didn't want uh, his client matter to be postponed for seven days because the state was not in possession of her profile as well as her address was not verified. So the, uh, my colleague then suggested to the, to the prosecutor in court, or can you fix an admission of guilt fine for my client? Of which it was a debate to then say, but how could you, what if your client is not a first time offender? Because the people who has to be given a, an admission of guilt fine should be first time offenders. Does the state have a profile for your client? Of which it was no. Do they know where your client stays? No. Then it ended up to be that they could not have done that. And this is very important because most of the admission of guilt fine in the past were set aside because people's rights were not explained, whereby you should explain to your client to then say he or she must know that once they pay an admission of guilt fine, yes, the matter will be disposed of quickly without him coming into court, but he, he or she is going to get a criminal record. This is very important. So people just think once they do that, they will then be scot free and then they won't uh, get a criminal record of which that is a problem. This is very, very, very important. One against your client. So in court, there are two uh, paper uh, papers that you need to complete before the state can uh, fix an admission of guilt. And this is regulated by the prosecutor who has to see to it that the admission, what do you uh, the profile is clean, he is a first time offender. Cause I saw some of the SAP 69s for some of my clients. 
they have a lot of previous convictions, but at some point they were paying admission of guilt fine. Then you tend to wonder, how did it happen? Then you can then realize that the prosecutor just wanted to dispose of the matter and just to get rid of it without doing a proper analysis of, of his uh, or her docket. So guard against that. Your client must be a first time offender. Yes, the prosecutor will fix that amount. Your client won't go to uh, won't go to court. And then on the other hand, your client is going to incur a criminal record. Khotato. I see a hand from Khotato. Good evening, ma'am. I wanted to find out at what stage of uh, this um, criminal procedure must you bring in representation? At what stage? Is it uh, before a trial date has been set or a, during pre-trial or after? At, at what stage do you have to make this representation? Once the state's investigations are finalized, you will then be given copies oh. of the docket. And then from there, you would request a postponement for you to take instructions from your client. So once you have all the evidence that the state will be using against your client, then on the other hand, you have your client's version. And then upon consultation, when giving your client advice, you then decide the best way for you to dispose of this matter is by way of representations. That's when you do that, not at the trial stage, because should it be that the trial starts, you can do, reverse the process. So once the state's investigations are finalized, then you consult with your client, get instructions. Are you answered? Tato? Neketo? Yes, I can hear you. Unfortunately, uh, maybe it's not good connection. So. Neketo? want to check on this admission of guilt fine is it the same as that out of court settlement no and secondly okay uh, secondly uh, you made mention of the court uh, making an inquiry if for example uh, my client's 14-day uh, period has expired uh, i just want to check in terms of what nature or shape does that inquiry take is there i owe there to make representations or is this just only the presiding officer making a decision or their prosecution team in terms of that decision. What would then happen with that? Your client would have then been arrested and brought to court by the I.O. The I.O. just execute a warrant. Then after executing a warrant, he gives the copy of the warrant as well as the docket to the prosecutor. Then the prosecutor enrolls the matter and then he or she will then say to the court that uh, this is so and so brought before court on the strength of a warrant of his arrest. Then the court will then take the, uh, the charge sheet will go through the warrant and then we'll then see if whether it was within the 14 days or after the 14 days. But as I say, if it's before the 14 days, they normally dispose of without having an inquiry. But should then the court then realize that, oh, this, ben, this person was a wall for the past two months or three months, definitely the court will hold an inquiry as to his failure to appear. And regarding the one of the, the alternative dispute resolution, that is something else that has got nothing to do with the admission of guilt fine. That one is when the parties on their own are willing to settle the matter outside court. What normally happens is you can't just um, approach the witnesses without first getting prior permission to the prosecutor. You will bring it to the prosecutor's attention to then say that it's my client's instructions that can't we resolve this matter outside court. What happens is the 
prosecution will then subpoena the witness to come to court and on the day in question will then will have sort of a round table whereby we will talk about whatever then if the witness, the witness agrees to whatever you guys are bringing forth that will be settled and there's paperwork thereof that needs to be completed where everybody agrees to their to their settlement then if the party the, the other party doesn't agree we can force them it's within their rights then the matter will then proceed for trial are you answered you. viewer um, thank you, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to find out. So you said if the if it so happens that the prosecutor didn't check that um didn't go through the docket thoroughly, and it it happens that the person actually has um previous convictions, but they they issued the admission of guilt. Is that is that taken back or? No, it's not taken yeah. back. That's their loss, basically. Oh, <laughs> okay. Because at the end and, of the and, day, it will be in the best interest of your client. Oh, okay. Um, yes. and then if if the client doesn't pay the the fine within the Which stipulated fine are we talking time, about? Which the fine? admission of guilt fine. Oh, the admission of guilt fine is paid there and there. So if let's say you you facilitate that with the state to say it's my client's instructions that uh, please arrange a, an AOG for us, then they, the the prosecutor will uh, go approach the SPP, then whereby they will agree on the amount. So the client has to pay that amount there and there before he or she is being released. If he doesn't pay it there, it lapses. It's not like a court fine that he can even pay at New York or wherever in prison he is. Um, I was also asking, you know, like for like environmental um, offenses, you can get you you get issued uh you can get issued a J five three four, and then, then if when, you don't, when do they expect you to pay? Um, it's usually a stipulated time, maybe like three weeks um at the nearest court date or whatever. So if that person doesn't pay by that time, does that mean that there's like an um? You, you the the J five three four you are talking about is the same as the person who was arrested for selling liquor, and oh. then without a license, then yes. that person the police will issue a fine and say to him either you pay this fine by this date, if not, then go to court. Is not an admission of guilt fine. The admission of guilt fine is for when one he has been arrested but doesn't want to the matter to be finalized in court. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, then let's then now proceed. Then um we now have a plea of guilt, but I think let's have a five minutes break or 10 minutes. Which one do we have to agree upon so that we can start with the admission of with the plea of guilty? Five ten. minutes break or 10 minutes? 10. ten. ten. I, think ten. Can, I think we can be back to uh, quarter ten past. Minutes. 10 minutes. Ten. Ten minutes. Yes, 10 minutes. Ma now let's agree on 10 minutes. It's fine. 10 minutes will be fine. Then let's come back at quarter past seven. Thank you.